Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you all so much for being here today. We're really excited to have you as part of today's event. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen here for you all. All right, my name is Kate Schwanhauser and I'm the Special Events Manager here at Food and Water Watch. And today we are hosting the year ahead, winning our food, water and climate goals. And this is part of Livable Future Live, our monthly virtual event series, which is a great way for us to connect with all of you each month to talk about current events and our campaigns to protect our food, water, and climate. And I'm really glad that you're all here today, and I hope you'll continue to join us at future events in this series. Um, before we dive into today's topic, which is all about learning about our strategies for the year ahead, I just have a couple of quick um, Zoom housekeeping reminders. Um, so first up, we'll have some time for Q&A later. So you can use the Q&A button that you see in your Zoom toolbar to send in any questions that you have throughout the discussion this afternoon. Um, if you need to turn on closed captioning to add subtitles to your screen, you can click on the live transcript button that you see in your Zoom toolbar to enable that feature. You might need to click on the three dots that say more um, to see the option for live transcript. Um, we'll also be doing a couple of polls today. Um, so once I launch those polls, you'll see that pop up in your Zoom sidebar. So please um, share your answers with us as we go through the event this afternoon. And finally, um, I'll be recording this event today. So I'll make sure I share that link with everybody who RSVP'd later. All right, um, so many of you here today are members of Food and Water Watch. And so you know that we work to mobilize people and communities to build political power so that we can fight for the solutions that we need to protect our climate, our food, and our water. And it's your support as members that allows this work to happen. And over the next hour, we're going to hear from our executive director, Winona, and many of the dedicated staff behind our advocacy and organizing work. And they're gonna lay out a lot of our plans for the year ahead. And we have some ambitious goals, but we know that with support from our members like you, we can reach them. So if at any point today you feel inspired to make a donation to invest in this work, we have an easy way for you to do so. All you need to do is take out your cell phone and text the word gift to the number 23321. We'll share that information in the chat for you as well. And again, it's your support that lets us invest in these long-term fights. So thank you so much for that. Um, before Winona kicks things off, um, I have a short video that I'd like to share with everybody that really captures what Food and Water Watch um, is all about. And so after that, you'll hear from Winona about Food and Water Watch's vision for the year ahead. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what she has to say. Um, I'll see all of you again for Q&A later. Um, but for now, let's get started with that video. Climate change is the existential threat of our time. We see it everywhere. Wildfires, hurricanes, droughts. To stop climate chaos, Food and Water Watch is fighting on several related fronts, starting with the battle to ban fracking. Our victories are many. The reason for our success is simple. We organize people to fight back against the corporations that put profit over human life. We're proud that, together with allies, we won a battle to require the LA Department of Water and Power, the nation's largest public utility, to provide 100% renewable energy by 2035. We're pushing California and the country forward in the climate fight. And we finally banned fracking in the Delaware River Basin, protecting drinking water for more than 15 million people, 5% of our nation's population. In fact, it's never been clearer that the fight for our climate encompasses the fights for our food and our water. Climate chaos threatens it all. Our fights are connected, our results are real, but there's more for us to do. Food and Water Watch is fighting to end industrial agriculture's destructive stranglehold on our food. And we're fighting to break the web of factory farms that poison our land, air, and water. We fight in communities across the country, in the halls of power, in the media, and in the courts. 
This year, we sued industrial meat giant Smithfield for violating consumer protection law by lying for profit. If the court agrees with us, it could order Smithfield to retract its lies and pay a penalty for its deceit. We also won a major battle against corporate giant Bayer. Glyphosate, a key ingredient in Roundup, was hurting people, and Bayer was using its power to influence the EPA. We fought back for years. Due in part to our work, Bayer is taking glyphosate out of its consumer products. Our supporters make victories like this for our climate, for our food, and for our water possible. Water is a human right, but the infrastructure we rely on for safe, clean water is crumbling and corporations are scrambling to take over public water. That's why this summer we urged congressional leaders to stop any infrastructure proposals that would pave the way for water privatization. We warned that the so-called bipartisan Senate framework would promote a slew of activities that would allow a Wall Street takeover of public water. We're still watching Congress, and we will stop privatization. And we're also fighting for passage of the groundbreaking Water Affordability, Transparency, Equity, and Reliability, or Water Act, a huge step forward in protecting our critical water resources and the health of our communities. Giant corporations are fighting to control our aging water systems. It's up to us to stop them. And together, we'll do just that. With more than 1.1 million supporters, including you, Food and Water Watch is fighting on three related and inseparable fronts, food, water, and climate, to win a safe, livable future for everyone. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. I know it's been a tough couple of years and almost all of us have been impacted in some way. But what I've been thinking about is we really can't give in to despair. I think the best antidote is to work harder than ever for a livable future. And I know at Food and Water Watch, that's what we're going to do. And we're gonna keep doing what we've had success at, organizing on the ground and building more grassroots power. We wanna make real improvements in people's lives and the environment. We've had organizers on the ground since 2005. And we are transforming that political power into meaningful change. And we're not afraid to be audacious in our aspirations, but we have a concrete strategy and we look for opportunities to move things at the local, state and federal level. What we do is we break down these huge problems that seem intractable and we find ways to move forward by winning local and state victories that are step-by-step -step going to help us achieve our longer-term national goals. And we don't look for easy wins. I'm talking about things that make a real difference. So 10 years ago, when others were talking about regulating fracking, we became the first national group to call for a ban. And then we went on to ban fracking in states like New York and Maryland. We followed those wins with dozens and dozens of other wins, stopping pipelines, stopping power plants, promoting renewable energy, and stopping drilling projects. In the last few months, we've had a string of long fought for victories. In Los Angeles, we've won a measure to phase out oil drilling. In Southwest Florida, 
we've blocked permits for new oil drilling. In New York, we won major campaigns to stop three power plants, and we helped pass a green amendment that recognizes the human right to water. In Pennsylvania, we stopped a permit for a coal mine and dump. And in another location in that state, we stopped a permit for a deep well site. At the national level, we have been relentlessly putting pressure on the Biden administration to live up to his promise about moving us off of fossil fuels. And just days ago, after all of the political pressure, the Biden administration announced a move to end all fossil fuel extraction in the Chaco Canyon region of New Mexico. Now we use the same type of strategy that I just described to fight sprawling, filthy factory farms and to work for a healthy food system. And we're using this approach to protect our water and to keep it clean and affordable for everyone. In all of the areas we work, food, water, and climate, we know that to make the long lasting and comprehensive change we really need, we must eventually pass federal legislation. We're mobilizing support for landmark legislation that will keep fossil fuels in the ground, that's gonna save our water systems, and that's going to keep industrial agriculture in check. Now, we all know that passing legislation is a long process, and we're working to develop the congressional champions we need to move forward on our long-term legislative goals. We wanna pass bills like the Future Generations Protection Act, the Water Act, and the Farm System Reform Act. This year, we're also pushing forward though with our state and local campaigns where we've had so much success. We have organizers who are working in communities from New York to Florida, Iowa, California, and beyond. And these teams are gonna to continue to build on the power of our movement. Many of the campaigns at the state and local level that we're working on can actually set a national precedent. And we do have a smart strategic plan to leverage those campaigns to make the most impact this year. Mitch and Emily and some of our organizers around the country will share the details of these plans. And Michelle is gonna discuss how our volunteer program is going to help move our grassroots organizing to the next level. Before I turn it over to them though, I wanna make one thing absolutely clear. We couldn't do any of this without your support. And it makes everything we plan to do in 2022 possible. We couldn't have achieved any of those wins I talked about without you fighting alongside us. Over the past 16 years, we've built incredible momentum and won historic victories. And it's all thanks to people like you, our members, our volunteers, and our activists. I thank you for that support. It's what makes our goals for this year achievable. You have helped us build a strong foundation and Food and Water Watch is ready, standing with you to make 2022 a year of true progress. Onward. I wanna pass things off now to Mitch Jones, who's our Managing Director of Advocacy Programs and Policy. Thanks so much. Thank you, Winona. Before I get started, um, we're gonna do our first poll. 
So as you can see, the question is, what first brought you to Food and Water Watch? And your choices are our campaigns to ban fracking and in the fossil fuel era, our campaigns against factory farms and food monopolies, our campaigns to stop water privatization and ensure safe drinking water, or all of the above. We'll give everybody a moment to register their answer. All right, and uh, let's see, all of the above is in the lead with 48%, followed by fracking, factory farms, and water. Thank you for that feedback on our first poll. You know, we can't have safe and affordable food and water without a habitable climate, and that's why we work on all three issues. For the past year, we've been working in a broad national coalition to demand that the Biden administration take strong action on climate change. The coalition is called the Build Back Fossil Free Coalition, and it has been working to pressure the administration to carry out climate action that can be done by executive action. We're demanding an end to fracking on our public lands and waters, the end of permitting for new fossil fuel projects, including oil and gas pipelines, and stopping liquefied natural gas exports. We've also been calling on the administration to declare a climate emergency. Doing so would unlock new powers that they could use to help protect us from the climate crisis we're facing. And in Congress, we're working with Representative Jan Schakowsky in support of her Future Generations Protection Act. In fact, Representative Schakowsky joined us for an event just last Friday to talk about that, that legislation. And I hope many of you were able to join us for it. This bill will ban fracking everywhere in the country. It will end the export of liquefied natural gas, and it will stop FERC from permitting new fossil fuel powered electric generation plants. It is simply the most aggressive piece of legislation directly taking on the fossil fuel industry that's been introduced in this Congress, and we are excited to be building support for it. You know, I wanna echo what Winona just said. This work isn't possible without the support of members and volunteers like you. We win because we work together. Our goals for this year are big and we need grassroots funding to win. The best way you can ensure that 2022 is truly a year of progress is by starting a monthly donation with us. If you're already a monthly donor, Thank you. If you'd like to become one, you can do that right now by texting GIFT to 23321 to make a recurring gift. And we'll be putting that into the chat. Now, on the food front, we're currently working with Representative Ro Khanna and Senator Cory Booker to continue to build support for the Food System Reform Act. This is our signature piece of federal agricultural legislation. Among other things, it will strengthen the Packers and Stockyards Act to crack down on the monopolistic practices of meat packers and the corporations that dominate our food system. It will place a moratorium on large factory farms, otherwise known as CAFOs, and it will restore mandatory country of origin labeling requirements for imported food products. We've also been working, and I have to tell you, this is a little bit of a scoop. We've been working with Elizabeth Warren on pending legislation called the Ban and Breakup Mega Mergers Act that would not only ban future mega mergers, like those that have created the huge companies that dominate our food system, but would also begin to break those companies up. This legislation hasn't been introduced yet, and I probably shouldn't have told you about it, but now you're in the know. We expect that legislation to be coming next week or the week after. Taken together, these bills will fundamentally reform our food system, making it fairer for farmers, better for consumers, and safer for our planet. 
Of course, in addition to fighting on climate change and reforming our food system, we're also continuing our fight to provide clean, affordable water for all. And here to tell us more about what we're doing on that front is my colleague, Mary Grant, our Public Water for All Campaign Director. Thanks, Mitch. In 2022, we are, mo we are moving forward on our, our efforts to protect water as a human right and a public trust research resource. Part of this involves tackling new schemes like water futures trading. Let's take a quick poll right now. How many of you have heard about water futures trading? Share a quick yes or no answer in the poll. So have you heard about water futures trading? Yes or no? We'll take a couple of seconds to choose your answer and then we'll share the results with everyone. Let's see. Ah, that's not surprising. Most of you have not heard about it. About three quarters of you have not heard about it. And it's not surprising because it's very new. We have seen Wall Street and financial speculators take alarming interest in water because of the climate crisis. In December 2020, following a devastating wildfire season and anticipating another major drought in California, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange launched the world's first ever water futures market allowing financial speculators to gamble with our most precious resource, water, and profit from water shortages driven by climate chaos. Immediately, we came together with a work group with our allies to oppose this. And at the end of last year, we filed a petition with more than 130 other organizations asking commodity regulators to suspend the water futures market. And we are expecting exciting new legislation soon in Congress to help tackle this issue. For water, we're also moving forward on our long-term strategic plan to pass the Water Act through Congress in the years ahead. The Water Act, that's the Water Affordability, Transparency, Equity, and Reliability Act, is the most comprehensive approach to improve our water systems and help ensure that every person has access to safe, clean, and publicly controlled water in the United States. The Water Act will create a trust fund to provide $35 billion each and every year. Why 35 billion? That's what EPA says we need to spend just to comply with federal law and fix our water and sewer systems. The Water Act will help remove lead pipes in homes and schools, address PFAS contamination. These are toxic forever chemicals. It will help improve contaminated household wells, and failing septics and promote public control of our water and sewer systems. We have 88 co-sponsors in the House and five co-sponsors in the Senate. We are growing momentum and using this as a guiding star for what real water investment should look like. Protecting water is a major priority for Food and Water Watch. If you're interested in learning more about what we're doing, you can join me next month on March 22nd for our World Water Day member event. I'll be joined by a panel of experts, including Maude Barlow, chair of our board, author, activist, and former senior advisor on water to the president of the UN General Assembly, who led the campaign to have water recognized as a human right by the UN. We'll also be joined by Catherine Miller from Save Chester Water Authority in Pennsylvania, to talk about the fight against water privatization. And we'll be joined by Professor Marcellus Gonzalez Rivas from the University of Pittsburgh, who is part of a joint research effort with us to study the impacts of water shutoffs and privatization. So we'll put the link in the chat for you to sign up and I hope to see you there. Once again, all this work really isn't possible without people like you getting involved. So I wanna thank you for all that you do. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Emily Wirth Food and Water Watch's Managing Director of Organizing. She's gonna talk about our organizing roadmap for the year ahead and how these mobilizing efforts underpin our policy work to protect our food, water, and climate. Thanks so much, Mary and Mitch for laying out these federal goals and thank you all so much for taking the time to join us today. You know, our team of organizers across the country, we work hard to support these federal goals um, in many different ways. We work on engaging allies and coalitions to support sign-on letters. We conduct large petition drives. 
call-in days to key elected officials, social media campaigns, public comment periods, and so much more. And we're also working really closely with our food and water volunteers. Some of you may be involved in working with us to get as many calls and emails into our specific elected officials, urging them to co-sponsor these critical pieces of legislation you just heard about, the Future Generations Protection Act, the Farm System Reform Act, and the Water Act. And as Winona mentioned, this is really part of our long-term strategy to build the political power that we need to pass these policies and protect our food, water, and climate for future generations. So given the, the climate crisis that we face, another area we're really focusing on on the organizing team is stopping the build out of new fossil fuel infrastructure projects. So we have organizers working on campaigns in states across the country, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Florida, California, Delaware, to stop new and expanded fossil fuel infrastructure projects. We simply can't be building new fossil fuel projects anymore, given what we know about the climate crisis. So we're taking on pipelines, fracked gas power plants, compressor stations, LNG export facilities. And I just tallied for you all for this meeting today and realized we stopped or delayed by a significant amount of time, 15 fossil fuel projects in the past year. And Winona mentioned a few of these, the big Dan Scammer, Astoria and Gowanus power plant fights. I'm sure some of you supported in New York. And just this week, a company in Virginia pulled out of the Chickahominy pipeline project that would have connected to a frac gas power plant we've been fighting for over a year. So we've had success in doing this. And this coming year, we're planning to take on even more of these projects. So I want to highlight just a couple of these campaigns for you today, just to give you a sense of them. So in New Jersey, I saw there were some of you um, joining the call from New Jersey. We're part of a coalition working to get Governor Murphy to institute a moratorium on all new fossil fuel projects. And one major project we're taking on is an LNG export facility that's proposed by this really uh, bad company, New Fortress Energy in Gibbstown, New Jersey. What the company wants to do is take frac gas from Northeastern Pennsylvania, liquefy it, and then transport it over 200 miles via both train and trucks through really a lot of heavily populated communities to this facility in Gibbstown. And from there, they're gonna export this overseas, likely to Europe. Um, and nearly every aspect of this project poses significant health and safety risks for residents along the route because LNG is highly volatile. So we've heard of train derailments, there've been traffic incidents with trucks exploding from transporting LNG. And so this is a dangerous project. And not only that, it will lock us into even more fracking in North and East, Eastern Pennsylvania. So we've been organizing with our allies to oppose this facility. We're working on a strategy to pass res resolutions in nearby towns to build pressure for Governor Murphy to reject the key permits needed for this facility. So far, we've passed 14 of these, including a recent one in the capital city of Trenton. And we're also pushing the Biden administration's Army Corps of Engineers to complete an environmental impact study. So um, I'm sure you'll hear more about this as we continue to work on it this year. All the way across the country in Ventura County, California, we're taking on the proposed expansion of a compressor station operated by the company SoCal Gas. Compressor stations are a key part in pipeline infrastructure because they maintain the pressure needed in these pipelines, but they make terrible neighbors. They're loud, they're dangerous, and they emit air pollution. They're a major source of air pollution. Um, so this particular compressor station is located in a predominantly Latino community directly across the street from an elementary school and boys and girls club. Um, and right near a neighborhood where actually our organizer in Ventura, Tomas, who's pictured there with the megaphone on the left, lives. And this was an action, the other picture is an action that shows how close the construction site is. You can see a backhoe on the left behind those trees to the elementary school, which begins at the fence right across the street. Um, so due to public outcry that we really organized when we noticed construction happening on this site, um, the Public Utilities Commission actually forced the company to stop construction at this project and conduct an alternatives analysis, 
but we've been pushing in the meantime for an independent environmental review because letting SoCal Gas do this is a lot to us like letting the fox guard the hen house. Um, and just last week, the Ventura County Board of Supervisors passed a resolution calling for an independent health study with the goal of removing this facility from this location, which is just not appropriate. So we'll be continuing to push hard on this campaign and keeping you all apprised of it. And then one more quick story, we're engaged in stopping some of the really insidious false climate solutions that are being proposed by both the, client, the fossil fuel industry and big agribusiness. As Mitch mentioned, our issues are really all interconnected and we're seeing that more than ever. And we're seeing an attempt by a lot of these corporate interests to greenwash their practices so they can continue operating with business as usual while giving us this impression that they're actually addressing climate change. And so the latest scheme with big ag is that they, they claim they can convert their factory farm waste into what they call renewable gas. Um, and so they're planning to build out all of these new facilities to, to turn these huge lagoons of waste that we know this industrial agriculture produces um, into, into what they claim will be renewable energy. And what we know is that this will just further entrench the factory farm issue industry in, in these communities and bring all of the air and public health effects as well as the animal welfare issues associated with them. So we're actually fighting a large factory farm gas facility proposed by a company called Bioenergy Devco in Sussex County, Delaware. This is again, a low income community already heavily burdened by pollution from the big poultry industry. Um, and Governor Carney there has key permits that his state agency has to grant to this facility. So we're raising awareness about this issue in the state and working closely with allies to push the governor to deny those permits. So that's just a few highlights of these campaigns. Again, this work simply isn't possible without the support of people like you. Um, so thank you so much for everything you do to help make this possible. And again, I wanna remind you, you can text GIFT, G-I-F-T, to 23321 if you want to make a recurring gift right now. And again, these monthly gifts go directly to fuel these types of campaigns I described and our other bold 2022 campaigns. Um, so really your support makes a difference. So now um, we also work at the state level to pass state legislation and we're involved in a whole myriad. We put forward a bunch of bills this year, but there's two really exciting state campaigns that we wanted you to hear directly about from our organizers. So I'm going to turn it over now to our Northeast Regional Organizing Director, Alex Beecham, who's based in New York, to tell you about them. Thanks so much. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Emily. I'm really excited to join all of you today and, and to talk a little bit about the work in New York and specifically about the landmark ban on gas in new buildings that we just won in New York City uh, this past December. It's a really huge victory for us, both organizationally and for the city's climate movement more broadly. With the move, all new buildings in the country's biggest city must be built without fossil fuels in just a few years time. So have an immediate impact on indoor air quality in our homes and buildings throughout the city but also have a massive impact on our efforts to reduce the city's greenhouse gas emissions. So here's how we did it. We won by focusing our energy on building a large multiracial grassroots movement that looked and felt like the city uh, at large. And that movement fought relentlessly to push the ban over the finish line. So we joined with our allies to form uh, something called the Gas Free NYC Coalition uh, notably working with really close partners uh, at New York Communities for Change, We Act for Environmental Justice, and our friends at NYPIRG. So together we formed this big, powerful coalition that in the end was too big and too broad to be ignored by, by the city council. And we did that by showing up over and over and over again, right? We divided up the city one council district at a time. We organized constituents to meet with their own legislators and demand they support the gas ban. So we did that kind of one-on-one -on -one outreach, but then we also rallied on council meeting days and literally pulled aside council members as they came into city hall for the day's legislative session. And we did that month after month after month. And that repetition I think is really crucial because it elevated the issue throughout the year of 2021, both for uh, individual council members and maybe more importantly for leadership and in particular for the former speaker, uh, Speaker Corey Johnson. 
we also had several really big organizing moments, perhaps most prominently at the virtual public hearing on the gas ban last fall. So we packed that hearing with members of the Gas Free NYC Coalition. It was hours and hours long, and one speaker after another was demanding they pass uh, the gas ban. So that, I think, was crucial to winning the campaign. Uh, and we did all of that in, fit in the face of some of New York City's most powerful political players, right? So this wasn't just going against the fossil fuel industry and the gas utilities as we do kind of all the time, but this was really going head to head against the real estate industry, which is some of the most powerful folks um, at the council level, most powerful folks in, in the state of New York. And we beat them. We beat them by focusing our strategy on building real people power that together we were able to overcome the immense lobbying and financial resources of, of our opponents. Put a little more simply, I guess, our people were more powerful than the, than the industry's money, and that's how we won this. Um, so this ban at the city level is a monumental victory in its own right, but even more than that, it's a game changer in the larger fight to move our buildings off fossil fuels. New York City, we're hoping, will be, have a domino effect on other cities around the country. As many folks on this call probably know, lots of other cities have already taken this step, but they're largely concentrated on the West Coast, and a lot of them are warm weather cities. We're hopeful New York City opens up a whole new front in the Northeast where we could win city by city, and also opens up the possibility to win in other cold weather cities across the country. And here in, in New York State, we've already immediately pivoted to the next step, which is taking that gas ban statewide. There's active legislation to do that in Albany right now. Even more exciting than that, Governor Hochul just put a gas ban into her state budget. The problem is that she wants to wait until 2027 uh, for that to start. Obviously, we don't have five years to wait, but that sets up a really key battle over the next several months where we're going to push very hard for the legislature to, to fight for a stronger timeline. And we're really hopeful that in the final state budget, which is a few months out, that we can win a gas ban and win one that is at least as fast as what we accomplished at the New York City level. Um, so that's a little bit about New York. And, and with that, it's time for me to throw it to my incredible colleague, Emma Schmidt. Emma is our senior Iowa organizer who will talk a little bit about the work there. So yeah, take it away, Emma. Thanks, Alex. Before I take it away, though, we want to hear from all of y'all again. So we've got another poll. Uh, this time, we want to know if you have heard of any of these problems with carbon capture and storage, also known as CCS. Uh, have you heard that it's dangerous and ruptures in pipelines can harm nearby communities, uh, that it props up the fossil fuel industry, it's expensive and our tax dollars are being used to fund it, it's not addressing the root of the problem, all of the above, or no, tell me more. So we'll take just a few seconds for folks to get their answers in. Oh, I missed my chance to do the Jeopardy theme song music. Okay, well, here are the results. It looks like a lot of folks, 49%, so about half, have heard of all of the issues related to CCS, uh, and 27% want to hear more. So y'all are lucky, because that's exactly what we're going to do right now. Um, so like, like I mentioned, there are a ton of issues with CCS, uh, including the ones mentioned in the poll. So let's actually just walk through some of the major concerns that we have. Uh, but before we dive in, uh, real quick, I'm Emma Schmidt and I'm a senior organizer here in Iowa where we are currently working to stop three different hazardous carbon pipelines. So let's start at the very top. Um, the carbon capture and storage process, or CCS, takes carbon that is released from a polluting industry like power plants or ethanol facilities, and it converts the carbon gas into a liquid so that it can be transported via pipeline to be stored underground, which in theory, it sounds okay, right? We, we do need to address our carbon footprint if we wanna mitigate the climate crisis. Unfortunately, CCS is not the answer. First of all, uh, it's incredibly dangerous. 
Carbon is an odorless, colorless gas. And if a pipeline were to rupture, it would release massive amounts of carbon that would quickly spread throughout the nearby areas. It's also an asphyxiant. So people even half a mile or a mile away from the ruptured pipeline could unknowingly be breathing in that carbon within minutes. From there, you could lose consciousness. And if the carbon does not kill you, it could cause irreversible brain damage. So what, what could possibly make these incredible risks worthwhile, right? As the answer so often is, it's money. These CCS projects aren't being proposed for the good of the people. They're being proposed to, to continue the longevity of the oil and gas industry. We've seen time and time again that these projects are not profitable without using the captured carbon for enhanced oil recovery. And enhanced oil recovery looks a lot like fracking. The carbon is pumped into the ground of nearly depleted oil fields, allowing the final dregs of oil to rise to the surface. And like fracking, it comes with serious consequences from earthquakes to negative health impacts. But it's not just fossil fuel companies bankrolling these carbon con jobs, it's our government. We have seen billions of dollars wasted on research and demo projects with billions more currently on the table from the bipartisan infrastructure bill. And all of those billions have only demonstrated one thing. CCS is not a legitimate climate solution. In fact, not only is CCS not a climate solution, the process actually creates more greenhouse gases than it claims to mitigate. It's, it's a classic example of the fossil fuel industry putting profits over people. Even worse, here in Iowa, these corporations are trying to use eminent domain to freely use our land for these dangerous schemes. They wanna take our land, our public money, and put our lives on the line, all to increase their own private net worth. Fortunately, however, Iowans aren't sitting back and allowing this to happen. We have seen just absolutely tremendous energy from Iowans of all backgrounds, rural and urban, young and old, Republican and Democrat, uniting together to stand against these dangerous scams. 30 counties across the state, many in deeply rural Republican areas, have voiced their opposition to the proposed pipelines. Hundreds of landowners meet weekly to organize a strategy to protect their property from being stolen by these greedy corporations. Coalitions of organizations fighting dangerous CCS projects have propped up, popped up um, all across the state, the region, and, and the country. Almost every day, we see new letters to the editor speaking out in opposition. We see people who have, have never been involved in an activist cause in their entire life consistently joining our movement. The, the pushback against these dangerous, these greedy projects has stretched far and wide. And we're gonna keep this momentum going until we stop these false climate solutions here in Iowa and across the country. And as you heard from my colleagues, we, we have a lot of big plans for the years, year ahead, but it's gonna take a lot of hard work too. But I know from experience that we can win these fights. It's your support that makes all the difference. So I am gonna turn things now over to Michelle to share some information on the ways that you can volunteer with Food and Water Watch to take action in all of these campaigns and more. Thanks so much, Emma. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle Allen. I'm an organizer with Food and Water Watch. It's really great to be with you all today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to, to be here. Um, so we've got one last poll for you. Um, and for this poll, we want to know if you have volunteered with us at Food and Water Watch or Food and Water Action. Um, so let us know if you've been on the calling or texting team if you've joined us at a rally, march, or bird dog event in your area, if you've collected petition signatures, or maybe you've written a letter to the editor to your local newspaper, or maybe you haven't volunteered yet, but you're ready to sign up. I'm going to give you a moment to fill in your answers, and then Kate's going to come back on and join us and share the results. All right, we have had nearly 30% of people here today who have volunteered with us at a rally, march, protest, or bird dog event. Um, a number as well on the texting or calling team or who have um, been involved in petition signatures or writing LTE. 
and about 60% of people who haven't volunteered yet, but are excited to learn more. Awesome. Thanks, Kate. Thank you so much to everyone who has volunteered with us before. Um, and thanks to all of you who maybe haven't volunteered yet, but you are ready to take action. Uh, really excited to um, show some ways that you can volunteer and get involved with us immediately. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Food and Water Volunteer Network, uh, and I'll talk about a few ways that you can get involved um, volunteers uh, are really important to our work and uh, they play a major role in our campaigns and make our work possible to fight for clean water, safe food, uh, and a livable climate. Um, so let's dig in and talk about uh, just a couple of the ways that you can get involved with the network. Um, the first is through joining our calling uh, and or texting teams. So our calling and texting teams reach out to fellow Food and Water Watch supporters through calling and texting uh, about urgent campaign actions, um, like asking folks to call their representative to urge them to co-sponsor critical legislation like the Water Act uh, or the Farm System Reform Act. Um, and the great thing about joining the calling uh, and texting teams is you can volunteer right from home when it's convenient for you. Um, so it's a really great flexible volunteer position. Um, so we're going to share a link in the chat that you can um, sign up if you want to join the calling and texting teams. Um, and you can also visit mobilize.us slash FWW. We post all of our calling and texting volunteer opportunities there. Um, so always keep an eye uh, on that web page to find out how you can get involved. Um, so next, I wanted to let you all know about our climate liaison program. So if you're interested in learning how to lobby your elected officials, consider becoming a climate liaison. Um, this program is a joint effort with Progressive Democrats of America. Uh, we are working together to train up grassroots lobbyists across, across the country um, to get folks to meet with their Congress members and get them to support bold climate legislation uh, like the Future Generation Protection Act. Um, so if you're interested in um, doing some more lobbying and becoming a climate liaison, we do have a, an interest meeting coming up next month on March 2nd. So join us for that event. Um, and we're going to drop a link in the chat so you can RSVP to join us then. All right, thank you so much, Michelle, um, for sharing all those ways people can get involved. And big thank you to my colleagues too for laying out some of our priorities for this year. Um, it's really impressive to see some of the victories that we've had, which are all thanks to support um, from people like you here today. So I'm really looking forward to what we'll be able to accomplish together in the year ahead. Um, I'd like to invite all my colleagues back to the screen now. We do have a few minutes here for um, some Q&A. Um, and many of you submitted questions um, in advance when you signed up, and there have been a lot coming in through the Q&A box. So we'll do our best to, to get through as many of those as we can right now. Um, all right, so this first one um, is a question from Margaret. Um, with the federal government not making changes, are there other avenues we could try to take to get results on climate action? Emily, I'll throw that one over to you. Sure. I mean, I think we've got to continue the work that we described here um, at the state and local level. Um, you know, the campaign Alex talked about where we, we can ban gas hookups. Those are the types of campaigns Winona referenced that really set a precedent and have ripple effects around the country when we're able to accomplish them. Um, and when we're stopping the build out of new projects, we are taking on climate. Um, I will say, and, and we've mentioned this previously, that we always are trying to think really strategically and, and intentionally about how we take on these local and state campaigns in a way that we're building power for being able to pass the future federal policies we need at the congressional level. So we might choose to take on fights because they're in a congressional district of a key chairperson on the energy committee. And so we're always thinking about how we can, the efforts that we do now have real effects, but also allow us to build for what we know are the ultimate solutions we need over the longer term. Um, and we know some of these things will take time and that's why we have long-term strategic and multi-year strategies that we develop. So thanks so much. 
Awesome. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, it's all about building power. And that's, you know, the strength, that's the strength that we get from all of you here. Um, all right, let's see. We have another question from um, Baden. What necessary and large changes can be made to improve drinking water in the US to make sure that dangerous chemicals aren't in our water? Um, Mary, do you want to share some thoughts on that one? Sure. And that's a great question, um, Baden. So our vision kind of addresses it from both sides of the problem. One, we want to protect our water sources from pollution in the first place. And that's where we're working with communities um, to stop dangerous fossil fuel projects and factory farms. And we're also supporting legislation like the PFAS Action Act to regulate toxic chemicals in our water. But our big water priority is to pass the Water Act, which not only prevents sewer spills, would help prevent sewer spills, but it also would ensure that every community has the support that it needs to update treatment plans, as well as household wells to provide safe water for all. So thank you again for the question. Thank you, Mary. And I'll just uh, quickly remind everybody that if you're interested in learning more about our water work, um, you can join Mary again next month on World Water Day. Um, all right, we've gotten a lot of questions about our um, factory farm and food system work um, from David, Alice, and many others. So I'll try to summarize those all into just one question here. Um, what actions does Food and Water Watch plan to take to promote local and regional food resilience and security? Um, and something David notes is, especially in the face of increasing local extreme climate events. Mitch, I saw you uh, on mute. Yeah. Do you want to share some thoughts yeah, on that I one? Will. Um, so, you know, we've supported the Biden administration's efforts to get funding to build out meatpacking infrastructure to support small and mid-sized farms giving farmers an alternative to the big four companies that dominate each sector, whether it's hogs or poultry or beef. Um, but, you know, really both the, the merger ban bill that I mentioned earlier uh, and the, the Farm System Reform Act are going to be key in allowing us to develop regional food systems because those systems aren't going to be allowed to thrive as long as uh, those major companies continue to have so much power and dominate the industry and are in a position to really push what our federal policy looks like. So in order to be able to build those more resilient systems in the face of climate change, in order to build them uh, to, to have more regional food systems, we're really gonna have to, to take on that corporate concentration in the food system and break their stranglehold on our food system so that we can build a, a healthier food system for everyone. Thanks, Mitch. Um, and I'll ask my colleague, Meg, who's been dropping some links in the chat to find the link to a report that we published last year called Well Fed that outlines in greater detail Food and Water Watch's vision for a sustainable food system. So we'll, we'll put that in the chat for those of you who are interested in reading more um, on that issue. Um, all right, let's move on to another question. Um, this one is from Zachary, um, and Alex, I'm going to direct this one to you. Um, what can be done about cryptocurrency and NFTs? I know this is something that your team in New York is working on, and we've got a number of people joining us from New York today who might be interested in hearing a little more about that. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating and, and troubling, at least in New York. So there's, um, I guess I should just describe the problem. So there's this crazy thing happening in New York and around the globe where cryptocurrency mining operations are targeting old retired either gas or coal plants and refiring them and then using the power from them solely to power Bitcoin mining operations or other cryptocurrency it doesn't have to be Bitcoin in particular. Um, and this isn't just a theoretical threat, it's happening in New York. So uh, most prominently this power plant called Greenwich in the Finger Lakes is already doing this. And the implications are pretty dire, right? Because there are a ton of old dirty power plants mothballed both in New York and around the country. And you don't need, at least in New York, any new permits to fire it back up. So there's kind of like no way in the, the current landscape to stop it. Um, that's really troubling. Uh, there are a couple of things happening though that are more hopeful. So one is that that particular power plant's uh, air permit is up. And so we're engaged in a huge battle to force Governor Hochul to shut it down. It is unclear how that will play out, but there is a really big vibrant campaign. And for folks who might know something about the Finger Lakes, in some ways that was where the anti-fracking opposition years ago 
was kind of the hottest. These are, this is like an incredibly well-organized community and I'm hopeful that we can win that fight, but it's gonna be a fight. Um, but that's not enough, right? Because Bitcoin mining is sort of like the easiest thing to move around, right? It's just a bunch of computers. So you could simply go to the next mothballed power plant. And so we also are fighting for legislation to establish an immediate moratorium on that practice in New York and are pretty excited about that. It passed through the Senate last year. So there's a real shot. We could get it through both houses this year, um, but it's gonna be a sprint from now to June to, to get it done. Um, and I'll just say also, I mean, it's New York, right? But this can happen anywhere, right? We're, we're, it's happening around the world, uh, particularly in Eastern Europe. But if we don't begin to stop it um, locally in New York, I think it is rapidly gonna come to other states. We're already seeing it in Pennsylvania and the Dakotas. We could go on and on. So. Hopefully we can we can kill it. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, definitely um, stay tuned um, for more information from Food and Water Watch on our um, articles and press releases on all the work um, that the team is doing there. Um, let's see. Um, we have another question from um, Stephen, and he says, um, "So glad you explained more about carbon capture and storage. From the name, it sounds so reasonable, but I had no idea about these impacts." Are there other attempts at greenwash solutions like this that we should be aware of? Um, Emma, can I pass that one to you? Absolutely. So, I mean, yes, this is a, a constant battle we faced with, with greenwashing. Um, we know that polluters just, they, they love to hate on environmentalists, but they frequently use deceptive language that sounds pro-environment or pro-climate to, to try and pull the, the wool over the public's eyes. So for example, um, along with carbon capture and storage, we're seeing greenwashing scams like blue hydrogen and, and carbon trading schemes. Um, and of course, uh, what I'm not fighting these pipelines here in Iowa, I'm fighting factory farms. There's over 10,000 of them across the state. So I can't not mention the factory farm biogas that's popping up in Iowa and other parts of the country. Um, and it's just another false climate solution. Um, and I know Emily briefly touched on it, but it's basically um, when they take the waste from livestock and, and convert it into methane, which can be used as an energy source. And of course, the industry doesn't mention um, that methane is a greenhouse gas that's even more potent than carbon dioxide, and it doesn't begin to address the root of the problem. In fact, it winds up incentivizing factory farms to expand to even greater sizes, increasing the negative climate impacts, uh, along with um, all the other harms associated with factory farming. So I think it really comes down to uh, the old adage, um, if it sounds too good to be true, it, it probably is when it comes to greenwashing. So true, thank you, Emma. Um, we're coming up on time here, so we'll just take um, one more question. Um, and this is another one that a couple of people um, submitted in a similar theme. And so I just thank you so much for everyone being so engaged in this. Um, so basically people are asking, what's the most important thing I can do today to help? Michelle, do you want to share some thoughts? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I'm going to share two things. I think there are two really important ways uh, that folks can support our work and help fight to protect our food, water, and climate. Um, first is volunteering and getting engaged with our work, you know, regardless of where you live or how much time you have to give. We have opportunities uh, for folks to get engaged and help support this work through volunteering. Um, so sign up to get involved as a volunteer with us. Um, and then the second thing is donating. Donating is a super important way to support our work. Um, truly, our members make the work that we do possible. We cannot do it without you. Um, so um, becoming a, a monthly supporter is also a really a crucial way to support the work that we do. Thank you, Michelle. Um, all right, and so that is all the time that we have for questions. And I know we didn't get to everybody's, but thank you all so much for sending those in and we'll do our best um, to follow up with people um, afterward for any questions we didn't get to. Um, and I do just wanna thank everybody so much um, for all of your work fighting alongside us um, as we take on these campaigns this year. Um, it's really inspiring to be part of such an incredible community of people like you who are so passionate um, about this work. So I appreciate all of you being here today and for being part of Food and Water Watch. Um, and as Michelle mentioned, um, 
you know, donations go a long way towards helping us invest in these long-term fights so that we can keep up this progress that we've been able to achieve um, and accomplish all those goals that we've set out for this year. Um, so if you're feeling inspired, all you need to do is text the word GIFT to the number 23321. Um, and I do have just a few final reminders for you before we close out today. Um, so this event today was part of our monthly um, virtual event series called Livable Future Live. And we do have a couple of exciting topics coming up um, over the next few months that you can see here on the screen. Um, so next month on World Water Day, as Mary mentioned, we will have um, a panel with um, some incredible activists talking about protecting our water resources. And then in April, we'll all be convening for a virtual Earth Day Summit. So I invite you to join us for that to learn and celebrate with us. Um, and then in May, we'll be talking about the economic costs of food monopolies. And this will dig into um, some new research that Food and Water Watch has put out, digging into how the consolidation of factory farms and grocery store chains impacts us as individual consumers. So I invite you to sign up um, for any of those events over the next couple of months. And I do also um, ask you all to take our post-event survey. We do really value your feedback um, and it helps shape this event series. And so everyone who fills out that survey will be entered into a drawing to win a Food and Water Watch bandana. Um, and you can see one of our New York organizers here uh, modeling that bandana at a, a protest that we held um, in DC last fall. Um, so Meg will put that link in the chat for you um, to fill out the survey. Um, all right, and so that does bring us to the end of our time together today, but I just want to thank you all so much for joining us, um, and I look forward to seeing you um, at our next Livable Future Live event on World Water Day in March. So have a great afternoon, everyone.